Welcome to the number one health and wellness show across the nation. Get ready to tap into the best fitness, nutrition, and lifestyle advice right at the palm of your hands. Tune in to powerful interviews that uncover key components to conquer the mind, body, and soul. Unlocking your greatest potential, it's the Fight for Your Life Health and Wellness Show right now on AM 1340 and 96.9 FM Fox Sports Radio. Here's your host, Jessica Lane. Hi guys, my name is Jessica Lane, on an air fitness personality and health reporter with Fox Sports Radio, and I want to welcome you guys to the Fight for Your Life Health and Wellness Show on Fox Sports Radio. Now, this show is intended to help individuals conquer anything that may be inhibiting them from reaching their best self. Whether it's physically, mentally, spiritually, or emotionally, we are all at some point fighting for our lives. And today I have a phenomenal person with me. His name is Dr. Baru. Um, among many things, he is a naturopathic doctor. He believes in having food be your medicine. And not only that, he is known for implementing the only vegan restaurants in low-income, impoverished neighborhoods. How are you today? Very well. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. So tell me a little bit about your journey because one, like I think you as a whole, your statement in itself, like to have the only vegan restaurant in, in low-income neighborhoods is tremendous. Um, but two, also you being a naturopathic doctor, tell me a little bit about that. Well, we'll start the journey back when I was seven. I had a beautiful second grade teacher who had uh, thought that I shouldn't eat pork anymore. And that started me on the journey to understanding there was a difference between food that was healthy and unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So I stopped eating pork as of that day. Then mm -hmm. it was about three or four years later that I stopped eating all meat. Mm -hmm. and when you were seven? When I was 11 at that point. Okay. So seven, I started with no pork. Wow. 11, meat. And I made the decision, at 11, I made the decision because I realized that I was worth it. Right. I made the decision at seven because she was my woman. She was my wife. She was my girlfriend. That was my second grade teacher. And I treated her like, you know, <laughs> a, a child with his favorite teacher, you know, the love of his life. Okay. And uh, so I did that, and that started it. But I realized later in life that what she implanted in me is a self-worth. Right. That other children didn't have and couldn't relate to. So right. as I was on this journey and was steadfast, I was going to eat vegan for the rest of my life. Other people couldn't relate to it. But I always had that, that pivotal moment when I was seven years old that a woman came to me who I enamored, who I thought was the most beautiful woman in the world. She said, you know what? You shouldn't eat pork. And I was like, boom, no more pork for me. So let me ask you, how was that in your household structure? Because, you know, as a child, your parents feed you. Your parents are the ones that provide food for you. So how was that sure. conflict? Well, well, dad wasn't agreeable. You know, he said, look, if my wife prepares it and you live in this house, you're going to eat it. And it was like my brother and sister were like, ooh, I can't wait till next week because we always had pork one day out of the week. Right. So next Thursday we were having our pork and uh, pork chops again. And uh, I didn't eat it. My father said, don't get up from that table until you finish your food. And I fell asleep at the table because I wasn't going to eat it because Miss Williams rang real high in my mind. Even though my father had a real strong hand, I was like, eh, this is going to be tough. But I was able to hold on and my father relaxed. He said, all right, I'm going to let you do this, but, you know, don't try nothing else. You know, I don't care who tells you. And um, so I stopped pork. I stopped meat, when, all meat when I was 11. And ironically, about 20 years later, my father called me up on the phone. He said, you know, it's crazy what I'm about to tell you, but my medical doctor just told me I shouldn't eat any more meat. Wow. Mm -hmm. so, wow. Yeah, if he'd only listened to me when I was doing it, he would have had a better health outcome. But uh, that started me on the journey to eating healthy. And what made me get into the business is because I noticed that every time I wanted to go to get something healthy, I had to go outside of my neighborhood. Right. I'm like, this is crazy. Every time I want to eat what I eat, I got to go somewhere. No, that doesn't make sense. So I uh, decided I would open up my own, and I started in my garage in 1995. Wow. And uh, that started me on the journey. Then after being on the journey for about nine years, I said, you know, the best way to get more customers is not really marketing, it's education. Right. Let's educate so we can substantiate the decision that people are making to eat healthy. 
Right. So we started educating. I became a naturopath. I was educating every week. I was teaching classes on health and wellness. I was bringing in other health experts like uh, Dr. Jewel Pukum from down in Atlanta and other health experts. Right. And it really grew our business. And it made our business model make sense to a lot of people. Right, right. So what do you think is some of the some of the most pivotal things that you feel like need to come across to our community? Because I know specifically for me, um, I primarily train mm -hmm. African American women and African American in general as a whole because we deal with so many health disparities within our community. And even when it comes to health care, it isn't as affordable depending on the jobs in our community as it would be for our counterparts. Mm -hmm. So I find though that when I'm trying to educate um, people on, well, our community on nutrition, mm -hmm. sometimes I get a roadblock because, of course, people have eaten a certain type of way mm -hmm. for the duration of their life. And then they come into adulthood and they face health disparities and challenges. And then you are trying to completely rewire mm -hmm. their mindset and thought process when it comes to food. Mm -hmm. What do you think some of the biggest challenges you face? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the biggest challenge was taste, because that's one of the, the, we sit down to eat many times because we're hungry, right. but a lot of times it's because we want to have that good taste experience. Right, or a societal experience. Sure, yeah, when we're integrating, when we're hang, having fun, right. we're doing our thing with other people, but taste is real significant, because right. if it doesn't taste good, it doesn't matter how healthy it is. <laughs> Right. It doesn't matter how little it costs or much it costs. It's like, I'm not going to eat that. Right. So we knew we had to make it taste good, but we didn't want to just make it taste good. We wanted to make it taste good to the palate of the, of the African American. Right. To the underserved and disserved communities. We wanted them to have a good taste experience. So their transition to eating healthier wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't have so many roadblocks. Right. So that's why we chose soul food. Plant based right. foods. Right. So, in choosing the soul food concept, it allowed us to, you know, put a couple of things in there. You know, we, we want a little bit more sugar, we want a little bit more salt in our foods. And so, we're able to offer the, them that, but healthier than what it is that they're getting out there. Right. Because I think one of the main things is um, that the American diet is completely different from the African American diet. Right. And so when it comes to the Food Guide Pyramid and all of these things, like when Michelle Obama did her Let's Move campaign, and we're learning now to eat kale and eat all of these greens, it's like African Americans, we still would completely consume it into like saturated fats. We would cook our collard greens down to where there's no nutritional value. Mm -hmm. We would put sugar, hot sauce, Vinegar, mm -hmm. all that, yeah, yeah, neck yes. bone, yep, yes. all of that. Yes. Yeah, so taste is important, especially for those of us. We talked a little bit about self worth. So mm -hmm. the self worth of our community is, is, it plays a role in all of this. Mm -hmm. I feel bad about myself. I feel bad about who I am. I feel bad about my life, my pr past, present, and future life. I feel bad. So the only thing that I can feel good about sometimes is food. Right. That's the only thing that gives you that guaranteed good experience. Relationships aren't working, you know, my job isn't working, my family environment is not healthy, it's not where I want to be. So I got food as my go-to. Right. So what we knew is we needed to make that food taste good. And we wanted them to have a similar taste experience. So we give it the similar names and we give it the similar texture with the food that we produce out of the restaurant. But we also, uh, you know, that taste is big. And we give them that taste experience. So many times people will come in and be like, wow, I haven't had greens like these since I've been down home with my grandmother. Right. You know, and that's what we do. We want to make food that tastes like down home. Right. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned bringing people up here and, and the education of nutrition. Mm -hmm. And what do you think some of the most um, applicable things in these conversations? Gotcha, gotcha. Well, what it, what it is that our, our, our people, what resonates with our people is when they get sick. So, or when they know somebody who is sick. So when you have somebody who's got diabetes and they're being told that you're never gonna be able to defeat diabetes, and then they get this information that, wow, you can overcome it, what? You know, I can just change my diet, I can overcome high blood pressure, I can overcome. So knowing now that they have a, a GPS roadmap coordinated uh, pathway to overcoming these health challenges that they thought they were gonna be chronically faced with for the rest of their life. You know, those are the most significant and poignant parts of what it is that we share with people. How to overcome health challenges. It's not even how to avoid them. 
because most people are not as motivated by avoiding as they are uh, overcoming. It's that pain, you know, the pain of not being able to function like I used to. So I'm diabetic now, I'm taking this metformin, I'm taking these chemicals, and my life is not normal anymore, you know, or my blood pressure, you know, I, I can't eat like I, I would like to eat, or I, I can't do things that I want to do. I always, I always got these headaches, my eyes are always blurry. You know, so they get all of this, uh, they, they come to us with all these health challenges and we're able to tell them, no, there's a pathway out. Is that, a t is that how you came up with the concept that um, food is your medicine? Food is your medicine and eat the cure. Eat the cure was actually the first concept that we came up with. We said, you know, why run for the cure? Why, you know, march for the cure? Why demonstrate for the cure? Let's eat the cure. We have the capacity to take charge of our health and eat the cure. So that's what we, we embarked upon. And food being your medicine, of course, we didn't create that. It's been around for many, many years. But what we decided is food is your medicine, yes. But what we would do is make your medicine taste good. So we took the concept food is your medicine and just, you know, kind of made it, gave it some flavor, gave it a little soul. So for the people that do not have access to your restaurant, but really need to change their eating habits and their eating um, lifestyle, how is it that they can do this sure. effectively sure. if what, they don't have access? There, there are about three or four things that I would suggest that they do. There's some really good videos out. I won't, I won't market any of them, but there's some really good videos out there that can help substantiate making the change. One. Two, if you're not around people who want to make the change that you're wanting to make, then you probably need to kind of begin to interface and interact, socialize with people who want to make the same changes that you want to make. Right. And three, I would say all of us have access to healthy food somewhere around us, you right. know, even if it's in your own backyard. Right. You know, go to YouTube, get some recipes, plant some food in your backyard, get some recipes and start making your own food. Might sound hard at first, but it's doable. It's right. what we used to do. It's how I was raised. Every day I would go out in the backyard and give my food. You know, the world is different now, but mm -hmm. it isn't that we're at a place that we can't get back to, especially when the motivation is to be well. Right. And I would say the fourth thing would be, we really got to avoid um, the interaction with the whole fast food industry. We, gotta, we have to disconnect and disengage. It's so convenient, it's so inexpensive, it's, it tastes so good right. that it just makes us, oh man, this is so right, this is what I need in my life right now. No, it's not, because we're seeing people with health challenges. I mean, the African-American community is, is now suffering from the worst health challenges across the board of any population of people. Right. And it's because of the convenience, it's because of our culture, it's because of what we're accustomed to, it's because of the price, it's because of our taste buds. And all of those things should not rank be, uh, higher than, is it good for me? Right. That should be the most important thing. Right, right. I resonate with that. And, and specifically for me, I find it challenging trying to change someone's mindset. Mm -hmm. Um, and trying to, especially when I have clients that have health disparities or even family members that have health disparities that it's like you know what you need to do, but doing it is completely different. Mm -hmm. Or I will do it for a week or two weeks and then I divert or regress back mm -hmm. to where I started. What do you think some tips are to help you get on and then maintain that lifestyle change? Well... Um, first, I think looking in the mirror and, and committing to yourself that you're worth it. Right. If you don't believe that you're worth it, then you're not going to do it. You have to commit to yourself that it's worth it for you to make these changes and right. to do this work so that you can get this outcome. Right. And if you, if you can't get past that hurdle, then the first thing that comes across your way that causes you to look to the side, you're going to be off on some other path. Right. So the best thing to do is to get into a space where you're uplifting yourself and get around people who uplift you. Mm -hmm. And when you're around people who uplift you, more than likely, they're already doing the right things. Right. So, you know, it, it helps It helps build you up. Then uh, education, again, is, is key. You know, right. just being educated and, and being around people that are educated. That, that's important. Don't put yourself in a space where you, you're, you're going to be um, tempted you know, stay away from that. You know, that's why I say those fast food joints, you know, just stay because it's too convenient. You know, right. for a dollar I can get all of that. Man, yeah, I'm going to do that. Mm -mm. No, don't do that. Right. Because too many people did that every day until the point that they have colon cancer. And then it's like, wow, I wish I hadn't done that. Right. Yeah. So, and pain is, a, like I said, pain is a great motivator. So sometimes hearing about the challenges that other people have is, 
you know, is a motivator. It's like, whoa, all of that, you lost all of that, you can't do that, you, you no longer are doing that, right. and boom, boom, boom. You know, right, so. and it's so unfortunate that I feel like sometimes people don't change until they have a health care. Right. Yeah, that's that's the major motivator. And that's the saddest. You know, pain is a great motivator. Yeah. And when you start realizing you're losing your life, you're losing your quality of life, that represents pain. Men who are now on diabetes medication or high blood pressure medication only to find out that now they're impotent, that's a great motivator. Like, Whoa, I didn't know that this was going to be the side effect of the medication. Yeah, it's not the side effect of the medication by nature. It's the side, of medica side effect of the medication um, by design. Right. They designed it to cause you to be impotent because they knew that then you'd be another customer. Right, right. And you split, you, you just um, pinpointed something that I tell people all the time because I don't believe in medicine. Mm -hmm. I believe that medicine is a drug that leads to something else to go wrong or haywire in your body. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, you know, you have people taking thyroid medication that's leading to high blood pressure or mm -hmm. vice versa. And then you have people taking di diabetes medication. You have people taking um like let's say even women for instance women will take like a yeast infection medication and then get a, a bacterial infection or something like that so mm -hmm. how is it that you would mm -hmm. would would talk about these medications and um the importance of not taking right. pharmaceutical medication well first off i would i would tell everybody if you're not ready to make the lifestyle change keep taking the medication if you're going to keep eating all that crap that you've been eating, keep taking the medication because that's for you. That's for those of us who are undisciplined and don't have the right self-worth and won't eat healthy. However, I would say for, the, uh, for those of us for the, that are prepared for the change and, and making this uplift in their own lives, there's something that I would put into their ear. That is, if me taking your high blood pressure medication will make me sick, because they tell me don't take his blood, high blood pressure medication because it'll make me sick. Well, if me taking your high blood pressure medication will make you me sick as a, as a healthy whole person, then the best that you can expect out of you taking the high blood pressure medication is that you're going to be sick. So you're never going to get well. Otherwise, if the medications were designed to cause you to get well, a well person should be able to take them and they not get sick. That's not the case. So that, and why do you think that is? Let's pinpoint that. Well, because the industry is not designed to um, create wellness. Right. They don't make money off of wellness. Right. They make money off of sickness. And if they can keep more people sick, they can keep more money coming in. Their shareholders, their stockholders make more money off of them selling more product. Right. They're not in the business of causing you to overcome diabetes. Right. They just want to treat and mask your diabetes. Right. I'm so, so happy you said that because a lot of people don't realize that 70% of healthcare spending in America goes towards treating preventable chronic illnesses opposed to preventing them. Right. Mm -mm. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, so a couple things that now I want to get into because I have so many people I have just been talking you up I have so many people that have so many questions we aren't going to do any phone um, calls but I do have questions via social media so I want to ask you if you're okay sure no problem all right so I, I would say while you're looking for the questions I want the audience to know that I'm a naturopath I'm not a medical doctor, so what I say and what I share with you is based on the knowledge and experience and, and the work that I've done in the area of natural healing. And natural healing is just healing through nature, you know, diet, you know, fitness, mm -hmm. even emotional and, and, and psychological, the things that we can do that can bring about healing. It's no different than, you know, when, when we had, uh, when we felt bad and we would give grandma a hug when we were children, how grandma could make us feel better. Well, that's right. energy healing. Right. That's no different than eating healthy food, which is energy healing right. inside of the body. Right. So, I'm a, again, I share with the audience that I'm a naturopath. Nothing that I say is supported, regulated, or even liked by the AMA, the Department of Agriculture, or any of those other organizations. They don't like people to do what it is that we're doing, which is really empowering you, the end user, empowering you, the customer. So, that, yeah, I say all that, and, I, and um, again, I would let you know that I'm a naturopath and I'm, I'm not a medical doctor. So the information that I share is not liked or supported or regulated by the USDA, the AMA, or any of those other A's out there that, that are, as we were just sharing, are really in the business of keeping us sick and making money off of keeping us sick. All right. So I set this up because um, 
we still have our viewers from Fox Sports Radio, but right here I have a lot of people that just have questions that have come up. So I'm just going to start this just for them so that they can get their questions answered. So Regina said, what should I eat for a hypoactive thyroid? I gave 25 pounds since being diagnosed, which is crazy that we just spoke about that. Sure. So. So uh, the thyroid, um, the work that I would suggest that she do is you got to cut out the, the dead animal flesh out of your diet. And um, you got to cut out the food that is, has been or likely to have been radiated at all. You know, so that's, that's really big for us. We're seeing a lot more thyroid conditions in the United States of America now since the advent of microwave ovens. Mm -hmm. you know, so we have to pull back on some of these things that have become a part of our traditional life, and microwave ovens are one of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, microwaving and radioactive uh, food will definitely mm -hmm. impact the thyroid. You want to make sure that you're getting specific minerals in your diet. Um, one of them is potassium, and the other would be uh, the minerals that we're getting from kelp. Those are very good supplements to take to help normalize and balance and also purge and detox the thyroid. The organ system before the thyroid would be the, the liver. You want to make sure that the liver is strong, strong and healthy and vibrant. That, that would mean detoxing and taking uh, supplements that will help support the liver. A detoxification of a liver might be a lemon and an olive oil cleanse. And there are other uh, liver detoxes, but in addition to that. Let's, let's go into that in detail because okay. I don't want people to like squeeze some lemon then get a whole bottle of olive oil. So can mm -hmm. you please tell us the necessary well, uh, well, measurements? Well, I think for the specifics, I would encourage them and hopefully I'll get a chance to, I'll share with them my contact information because it depends on where they are. It right. depends on where they are in the health paradigm. It depends on their weight. It just depends on other health challenges they may have. It depends on their commitment to their health. Right. and whether they're prepared to deal with the outcome. But if you look up on the net, you'll see lemon and, and olive oil as a, as a liver detox. You okay. know? And there are other liver detoxes. There's a liver toner um, made with milk thistle you know, and uh, selimaron. So there are other things that can be taken. And we just don't know. And when you don't know, you don't know. You don't know what to do. Right. So you go to a medical doctor and he gives you something that masks the illness and treats the illness but does not provide you with a solution. Right. Okay, so Ms. Vicky said, what foods get rid of eczema? Eczema. Again, you're dealing with the liver. You're dealing with the external liver and kidney. So the, the, the kidney, the skin has been called the third kidney or and sometimes the external liver. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that those organs are detoxed. Mm -hmm. You can't consume and overconsume acidic foods and you definitely probably would definitely rather, you definitely want to remove um, gluten from your diet because that tends to be an irritant for the liver. For, for people with eczema. So well, also, for the so liver, and the liver being irritated will give you, will cause you to have, uh, in eczema. many instances, eczema. Okay, so we need to drink more alkaline. Oh, definitely. So alkaline, primarily no mm -hmm. acidic foods, and then um, detox the liver by <laughs> yeah, so we, we talked earlier about, the, there's several detoxes, but one of the, a, a good detox is a lemon and, and olive, olive oil detox. Okay, got mm -hmm. it. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, let's see, next question. What can I take for relentless leg syndrome? Restless, restless leg syndrome? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, no, no, let me re-ask that question. Sure. Okay. okay. What can I take for restless leg syndrome? Okay, so restless leg syndrome is... You know, there, there are probably a lot of sources for a challenge like that. Mm -hmm. So what I would say, you have to deal with your base. Mm -hmm. Your base is make sure that you're getting sufficient vitamins and minerals. You're getting the sufficient sunlight. You're grounding out the energy in your body. And what I mean by grounding out is you're going out and walking on the soil with your bare foot out in the, in the field somewhere, not in, your, in front of your townhouse where there's a little plot of dirt, you know, right there. I'm talking about walking out like in the park where your body's able to ground out a lot of that electricity and a lot of that, that energy that becomes toxic inside of our bodies. Wow. And, uh, I was not expecting that answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, there, there are other reasons why our body reacts, and, and sometimes it depends on the person. You know, one person may be having, you know, a, a problem with their nervous system. Another person might have an issue with, you know, just their emotional health and well-being, and it causes these things to happen. So it's varies. That's why I say you got to get the base first. So you got to get your vitamin D. You got if you if you're uh, plant based, 
you got to get your B12, you know, you got to get your omega-3, you got to get, you know, those basics so that the body has a foundation in order to be healthy. Because if you don't create that foundation, it's going to be unhealthy, it will be unstable, and you'll find things going wrong, and you won't necessarily know why. So if you give it that good cross-section of multivitamins, along with the alkaline water, along with the healthy diet, along with, you know, taking that 20 minutes a day to get some sunlight, direct sunlight, not through your window, not through the car window. Jay Solution said, what foods can reverse acid reflux or GERD? Okay. Um, what we have to what we have to look at with regard to the acidity inside of the stomach the stomach is supposed to be acidic it is where food gets digested com decomposed so that it can the nutrients can be extracted out of it in the small intestines however when we're consuming so uh, while we're eating our food we're consuming let's just say a cold beverage now you're diluting the hydrochloric acid you're preventing the body from having the, the appropriate concentration of acid you are, um, when you're consuming so much acid foods, you're overly acidifying the body. So you're, you're drinking a Pepsi or a Coke or something with your food. You're, you're acidifying the body and you're throwing off the balance that should be there inside of the stomach. I would say in order to achieve your goal of, of reversing the health condition, first off, um, we want to separate drinking and eating. Don't drink while you eat. You know, give yourself at least 30 minutes, preferably an hour. In addition to that, look at what you're eating. Most of what we're eating is acidic. Dead animal flesh is acidic. Heavily processed foods are acidic. You need right. to eat more dark leafy green vegetables, raw preferably, and uh, more raw foods across the board will help with this situation. There are two supplements that I would suggest that you take, and you don't have to go to a vitamin shop to get them. One is uh, cayenne pepper. And the other is apple cider vinegar with the mother, that cloudy apple cider vinegar. You take those and you're gonna see yourself begin to climb out of that situation. Now, if you damaged the lining of your stomach, then you're gonna to wanna to look up, you can give me a call, I can talk to you specifically about how to do it. You're gonna to wanna to get the um, slippery elm. There's a protocol that where you can use slippery elm to recoat the stomach, the lining of the stomach and uh, that'll help. Getting some additional enzymes into your diet is always good, and there's a natural way to do it with food, but also you can do it through supplementation. Get a, make sure that you're getting a full spectrum digestive enzyme to help break down the food so you're not having that, you know, the stomach is just, it just can't uh, function as it should. Right, okay, so last question, because I know you have to go. Um, are there any food remedies that can help with or what would be recommended for someone that's battling stage four cancer? Wow, I think you, you would need a, um, a health coach. You need a good health coach that has demonstrated to you that they can do this, they've done this, they've helped people. All stage four or these dis different stages means that it's moved on to other parts of the body. So, you know, it isn't the end of the road. You don't, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's stage one, two, three, or four, you know, you can get help and you can reverse it. You know, you just have to do the work. And most times you're so depressed, you don't even want to do the work. It's like, I want to drink something sweet that makes me feel good because I'm so depressed, I'm dying. So food-wise? Food-wise, you want to remove sugar out of your diet, definitely. Okay. You gotta remove sugar out of your diet. You want to remove any food that that becomes a sugar. So all the starches, you know, the carbohydrates. You want to remove those from your diet. You want to consume more alkaline forming foods. And there are, there are some specific alkaline protocols that you should engage that would help you overcome that. And again, that's where you you would call on a health coach, a naturopathic health coach, to assist you in that process. The less damage done by modern medicine, the easier it is for us to get you back on, on the path to healthy recovery. Okay. And this is a question that um, I feel like can be applicable to everyone. What food remedies can, do you think can help deal with seasonal allergies? Seasonal allergies, first stop taking a flu shot because if the flu shot worked, you'd only have to get it once. Right. You know, but it doesn't work, so you have to get it over and over and over again. And all you're doing is subduing the immune system. Right. And if you subdue the immune system, now you open yourself up to all, all manner of health challenges. Right. So the, um, the foods that you eat that are causing you to have an allergic reaction, you can always get your blood tested for allergy. And you find out what you're allergic to. And you can find out how to boost up your immune system, which is, is simple. We know 80% of our immune system is found in our GI tract. 
so you can get those supplements that will help boost your immune system so they won't be so quick to be at the point of intolerance, which is really sometimes what people are experiencing. They're experiencing an intolerance. Like I can be exposed to, you know, uh, pollen in the air, but if somebody just starts pumping pollen in my face, you know, it's at some point I'm going to reach a tolerance and my eyes are going to water up. I'm going right. to start sneezing and coughing and carrying on. Right. So you want to build up your immune system so that you're better prepared to deal with the levels of uh, allergens that are in our environment. Most of them we don't get a response from our bodies or our body is able to deal with and not, you know, we're not experiencing any dif difficulty. But because some of them are so dense and so concentrated and because our immune system is so subdued because we're taking all these chemicals which subdue the immune system, we're drinking the sugar which shuts off the immune system and, you know, this whole thing is about shutting off the immune system rather than empowering it then you end up with the results that people are getting. They're getting hate fever. They're getting other uh, allergic reactions that are as a result of you telling the immune system, I don't want you to do anything because every time you do anything, I got a runny nose or I'm coughing and sneezing and carrying on. Many times it's because the body wants to get out of it what is in it that is preventing it from properly tolerating or dealing with what you're being exposed to. Wow. <laughs> I just want to thank you so much because thank it was you. such good information i feel like uh our our listeners definitely gained some value from what you had to share today i think it's been um, a very impactful and powerful interview mm -hmm. food as your medicine yeah all right so tell us how we can reach you if anybody had sure. any questions or anything well the uh, best way to reach me is on the internet on facebook is a great way to reach me i do a lot of interaction on the social media side uh of facebook and also you can call me at 330-BARUCH-1, that's 330-227-8241, or you can email me at getwell at drbaruch.com, because that's what we do. We get well at drbaruch.com. <laughs> okay, Doc. Okay, so lastly, please tell our listeners that our live in D.C., please tell our listeners that live in D.C., what's the address to this restaurant, because y'all have to try it. We have three restaurants, so I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. We have Everlasting Life, which all of the restaurants are going to be named the same by the end of this year, so depending on when this is aired or when you view it, they'll all be the same name, which is going to be E-Life. All right, so all of the restaurants are going to be called E-Life. You have one, Evolve, which is in Tacoma Park. You have Everlasting Life, which is in Capitol Heights, Maryland. And the third one is? In Anacostia. In Anacostia. And that's right in the Anacostia Arts Center. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, mm -hmm. thank sir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, guys. So if you have any questions, again, you can reach Dr. Baruch at... 330. 227-8241. Again, 330-227-8241. All right. So again, if you have any questions, you can reach Dr. Baruch at 330-BARUCH1.